You guys ready to go? Yes. All right. As you know, if somebody says there's no truth, you're going to say, is that true? If somebody says there's no God, you're going to say, what do you mean by that? How'd you come to that conclusion? Have you ever considered the universe had a beginning, it's designed and so are you, and there's a moral law, which means there's a moral law giver? You could try that maybe. All right. Now we're going to talk about miracles. You guys ready to go on miracles? Yes. All right. Let's start by asking the question, before there were any mass communications, let's say go back 500 years or so, if one king wanted to communicate with another king across a great distance, how would he do it? He would do what? Send a message, right? And what would be on that message that would authenticate that the message actually came from the king? A seal, right? There would be a seal up in the corner that would seal the... Uh, message as truly coming from the king. And that message would ensure that the recipient actually is getting a message from the true king. It would seem to me that that seal would have to have a couple of characteristics. Number one, it would have to be unique to the king, right? Because if everybody had it, obviously they could send false messages from the king. And secondly, it would have to be difficult to forge. Because if you could forge it, then you could make your own seal and sell, send false messages from the king. It seems to me this is why miracles are done. And this is why, how the Bible explains the purpose of miracles. The miracle confirms the message from God. In other words, a miracle is kind of a seal from God that says, this message is from me. You could also put it this way. The sign confirms the sermon. If Moses is giving a sermon or Jesus is giving a sermon and Moses or Jesus does miracles, that would be an authentication that this man is speaking for God. Now, how many miracles are there in the Bible? Does anyone know? A lot. Very precise estimate there. There are a lot of miracles, but not as many as you might think. Dependent upon how you count them, because some of them are bunched up. But there's about 250 miracles in the Bible. Now, let's just take it from Abraham to Jesus, just to make the math easy. There's more, some miracles outside of this, but let's just take it from Abraham to Jesus. That's about 2,000 years. If you have 250 miracles over 2,000 years, how often do you get a miracle on average? Math majors, how many? One miracle every eight years, right? 250 into 2,000, this is not calculus, ladies and gentlemen. 250 into 2,000 is eight, right? So you get one miracle every eight years. But do they happen that way? Do you get a miracle and eight years later you get another one? And then eight years later you get another one? Now that's not a lot of miracles, is it? But how, how do they occur? Where do they occur in the Bible? They occur in three basic time periods. When God is doing miracles through people, he's doing them around Moses, Elijah, and Elijah, and Jesus and the apostles. Why? Because these people have new revelation that needs new confirmation. There's a new message that needs a confirming miracle. There's a new sermon that needs a confirming sign. There are periods in the, in the Bible, hundreds of years, no miracles. God is not doing miracles through people. Why? No new revelation. In other words, miracles are used to confirm a revelation from God. Now, before we go any further, we have to define what we mean by a miracle. Because I think we as Christians often misuse what we actually mean by a miracle. We're not very precise with our language. So... Let's point out that there are six different categories of unusual events. Here they are. Anomalies, magic, psychosomatic, satanic signs, providence, and miracles. The only one that qualifies as a miracle is the last one, a miracle. So let's explain what the other five are. 
Let's start with anomalies. An anomaly is a freak of nature. Uh, its power is physical. By the way, this is all in chapter 8 of the book, so you might not be able to keep up. <laughs> it's in the book. Uh, the traits are it's a natural event with a pattern, and an example would be a bumblebee. Why do you say a bumblebee? Because for years, we couldn't figure out why a bumblebee could fly. Its wings appeared to be too short for the size of its body. It shouldn't have been able to fly, but it flew, and we couldn't figure out why. So it was an anomaly. It was just kind of a freak of nature. We eventually figured out that the bumblebee had some sort of power pack on it that allowed it to fly, but up to that point, we didn't know why. We didn't call it a miracle. Why? Because, well... It seemed to be a natural law that did this, or it's a natural process. Bumblebees always flew. We just couldn't figure out how, uh, why. The second type of unusual event is magic. A uh, description would be a sleight of hand. The power is through a human being. It's unnatural, man-controlled. This is a trait of it. Uh, and an example would be like a rabbit out of a hat. It's unnatural. Why? Because rabbits don't live in hats, okay? I mean, it's... It's, it's like a card trick, or it's a, cutting a, a woman in half, or these kind of, of uh, things that you see in magic shows. In fact, a number of years ago, we went to a magic show in Las Vegas. It was put on by a group called Penn and Teller. I don't know if you ever heard of them, but uh, they're atheists, uh, but they have a really good magic show. And at one point during the program, they did this magic trick, and you're all trying to figure out how they did it. And then they pulled the veil back to show you how they did it. And after you saw it, you went, oh, that's so simple. Why couldn't I see that? It looked like they were doing something that seemed impossible. But now that I get behind the veil, I see actually how they do it. It's not a miracle. It's just sleight of hand. Magic. The third type of unusual event is psychosomatic. That is mind over matter. The power is mental. The traits are it requires faith and it fails for some sicknesses. In other words, there are psychosomatic cures out there. Um, an example of something psychosomatic would be my co-author on the book, Norman Geisler, for years had an allergy to flowers. Whenever he'd get around flowers, he would just well up and start sneezing. His eyes would water. He just couldn't go on. So he, he was preaching at a church one morning, and he got there a little bit early. He got to the church, and he got up to the podium, and uh, he put his Bible down, and uh, he looked down, and there were flowers right around, the, uh, right around the podium there, and he began to well up. You know, He started sneezing, and he, he was watering, and he looked over at one of the elders, and he said, <laughs> You're going to have to move these flowers before the service, otherwise I won't be able to preach. And the elder stopped and he looked at him and he said, they're plastic. <laughs> and Geisler said, you just sneezed at plastic flowers. That allergy has to be in your head. And it was. He threw away his allergy medication after that and he hasn't had a problem since. <laughs> now, I'm not saying that all allergies are this way. But some of them might be. I know of people who have been cured of, of, uh, of uh, psychosomatic blindness, right? They thought they were blind, but it was a mental thing, and they really weren't. Psychosomatic. Not a miracle, but a mental issue. The uh, fourth kind of unusual event is a satanic sign. That is an evil power. It's demonic. Uh, it's associated with evil, falsehood, the occult. It's limited in power. Satan cannot do true supernatural things. He can do super normal, normal things. If Satan, say, had power over life, then we couldn't believe the resurrection was from God necessarily. Why not? Maybe Satan did it. Maybe it's to get us off track. In fact, he, even in the Bible, when it, he reanimates the beast in the book of Revelation, he doesn't resurrect the beast, he reanimates him. When Moses does the miracles, uh, the plague miracles, uh, before the Egyptian magicians, the Egyptian magicians can imitate some of them, but when it gets to the creation of life, what do they say? Oh, this is the hand of God, we can't do this. 
By the way, if you notice, the plagues in uh, Exodus are not random. What are the plagues actually doing? All of the plagues are slams on the Egyptian gods. For example, they worship the sun. So what does God do? Blots out the sun. They worship frogs. What does he do? Sends them a lot more frog, frogs. They worship the Nile. What does he do? He turns it to blood. You get the idea. Which is telling us what? That Moses knew the Egyptian culture. That Moses actually was there. This is not an invented storyline. This is not wow, gee whiz stuff that's invented by some sort of fiction writer. This is real. They are actually, they know what the Egyptian culture is. In any event, this is a psychic, an example would be a psychic sort of thing. We had a question last night on psychic powers. And I know that some of you have been to other countries, particularly, say, third world, world countries, have seen some demonic activity and psychic things going on. Now, in our country, these kind of things are, if they happen, they're kind of under the surface. But in our country, we did at one time have, I don't know if it's still out there, it's the psychic hotline. You know, you could call in and get your fortune told. But before they tell you your fortune, they'd have to say, oh, what's your credit card number? And if you ever called in, you should say, you tell me what it is. <laughs> Come on. You're supposed to know all this stuff? <laughs> now, this is associated with evil and falsehood. This is to divert people from the truth. And it amazes me there are people out there who are into to psychic activity and demonic activity, yet they seem to deny the true spiritual realm of God and angels. They'll be involved in demons and Satan, but they won't be involved in God and angels, which seems really silly to me. <laughs> Why would you do that? They're more apt to believe in demons rather than angels and God. The fifth type of unusual event is the one that Christians often confuse with miracles, and that is divine providence. That would be a prearranged event where the power is divine, God's at work, but it's naturally explained in a spiritual context. And the example that we might use is the fog at Normandy. The fog at Normandy is a providential event that occurred through the hand of God, but he didn't suspend or overpower any natural law to do it. Why? Fog happens all the time, right? And the fog concealed our attack on the Nazis at Normandy, but it wasn't a miracle. It would have been a miracle if the Allied soldiers had assaulted the beaches and bullets bounced off their chests, right? That didn't happen. But the fog did help obscure our attack. So we might say that's divine providence. Now, Christians often call divine providence a miracle. This is a mistake, I think. It's not divine providence, or I should say it's not a miracle that, you know, I, it's a miracle I met my girlfriend. You know, unless she walked across the lake to meet you <laughs> on top of it, no, it wasn't a miracle. It may have been prearranged events that God had his hand in, but he didn't overpower a natural law to do so. He didn't suspend a natural law or overpower it. What is a true miracle is what we call a miracle, and that is a divine act where the power is supernatural. It never fails, particularly with regard to healings. It's immediate. It lasts. It brings glory to God, for example, like raising the dead. That would be a true miracle. So when we, want, when we talk about unusual signs and we talk about miracles, let's make sure we're precise with our language. Too often we're using providence as miracles when a true miracle is like raising the dead or walking across water or feeding the 5,000 or healing people who were blind and now suddenly they can see. Those are true miracles and that, those events truly demonstrate that someone is speaking for God, at least in Old Testament and New Testament times. Here is what we just said in one slide. There you go. You got it? 
Copy that down. Forget about it. All right. <laughs> so, Jesus and the apostles, Elijah and Elijah, Moses, they're doing miracles because God has given them the ability to do miracles to confirm to people that they truly speak for God. Now, here's the problem in our culture today. Many people don't believe in miracles. They think miracles are impossible or just out, too outlandish to believe, like Noah and the ark. How can you believe in Noah's ark? I mean, come on. That just seems crazy, doesn't it? Noah's ark? Please. I actually believe it occurred. In fact, in 2006, I went to Iran on a Noah's ark expedition with a friend of mine who's the real Indiana Jones. His name is Bob Cornuk. He's been looking for Noah's ark, the anchors of Paul's shipwreck, which I think he's found in Malta. Also, um, the Ark of the Covenant. He thinks it's at a church in Axum, Ethiopia. In fact, some scholars think that's really true, that the Ark of the Covenant is in the church in Axum, Ethiopia, but nobody can go in there and see it. I said, Bob, if you ever get a chance to go and look at the Ark, don't open it, because if you do, <laughs> your face will melt, right? <laughs> And he's also, I think, found the real Mount Sinai. And the real Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia. It's not on the Sinai Peninsula. It doesn't fit. In fact, Paul even says Mount Sinai in Arabia in Galatians chapter 4. Arabia is Saudi Arabia, not the Sinai Peninsula. But that's a whole other thing. In fact, if you Google fire or mountain of God, you can see this incredible documentary on it. But I want to talk here about Noah's Ark for a second. We went... 55 miles northwest of Tehran into the Elbers Mountains, we got to an area where we were told there could be the remains of Noah's Ark, and we saw this strange formation sticking out of the side of a mountain at 13,125 feet. We got up to it. It looked like it could have been planking from an old boat. We touched it, and it was rock. So we brought samples off of it, and took them back to the United States, and five out of the nine samples tested as petrified wood. But we can't prove it's Noah's Ark because it didn't say USS Noah on the side. <laughs> right? I mean, how could you? I don't know what it was. It could have been a geologic formation, but it was interesting anyway. And uh, resurrections people have a trouble believing in, right? I mean, everyone I know who's dead is still dead, right? You know anyone who's dead who's now alive? I don't know anybody. Maybe there's somebody out there, but... Everyone I know is dead is still dead. And for some reason, the big problem miracle in the Bible is Jonah. Is that a tale of a whale or a whale of a tail? I mean, what is the deal with Jonah? How can you believe in Jonah? Doesn't that seem crazy? I mean, really? Well, ladies and gentlemen, what is the greatest miracle in the Bible? People say the resurrection. No, the resurrection's easy compared to the greatest miracle. No, Jonah's easy. Yes, yeah, someone said it back there. The greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? I mean, if that miracle is true, if that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible, right? I mean, if it's true that God created the heavens and the earth out of nothing, can he do whatever he wants It's not logically impossible inside the heavens and the earth? Can he raise Jesus from the dead if he can create the whole universe? Can he do the, the Noah miracle? Can he do the Jonah miracle? These are easy for God to create the universe out of nothing. Now, here's the amazing thing. We have good scientific evidence and philosophical evidence. The first verse of the Bible is true. We went over it this morning, right? Yeah. So if that's true, maybe these other verses are true. You just can't philosophically rule it out as so many in our culture today do. They say, no, this can't happen. It doesn't happen. Miracles don't occur. Look, if Genesis 1-1 is true, every other verse might be true as well. You just can't rule it out in advance, as so many do. Now, I just said something a minute ago that you might not agree with. I said God can do anything he wants that's not logically impossible. And you're probably thinking, well, I thought God being all-powerful, he could do whatever he wants. No, there's some things God can't do. Like what? He can't do logically impossible things. Like what? Like you can't create a square circle, right? Doesn't exist. Can't create a one-ended stick. Logical impossibility. Doesn't exist. Can't create a married bachelor. Some guys try, but no. Doesn't exist. Can't create an honest politician. 
okay? There's some things that are just too hard for God, right? In fact, you can do some things that God can't do. What can you do that he can't do? Lie, right? Change. What's he going to change from? He's already the standard of perfection. Any change would necessitate a move from perfection to imperfection. He can't change. He's this unchangeable standard by which everything else is measured. So you can do things God can't do. But if he could do those things, he wouldn't be God. That would make him actually weaker. You've probably heard this too. Can God create a rock so big he can't lift it? This is supposed to be a conundrum, right, for Christians. Like, whoa, yeah, we seem to be limiting God's power. Either way we answer. But what we have to do when you get something like that is you got to ask questions. Don't try and answer it right away. Can God, so make, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by a rock? What is a rock? In fact, you could ask the question this way. How big is the rock? And the person goes, well, big. Big. How big is big? Really big. How big is really big? Infinitely big. Now, what have they just done? They've just traversed in what we call in logic into a category mistake. What's a category mistake? A category mistake is when you're confusing two categories. You can't have an infinitely big, finite rock. Do you see? Anything that's finite can't be infinite. And every rock is finite. So no matter how big God creates the rock, he can lift it. But even God can't create an infinite, finite rock. It's like creating a square circle or a one-ended stick. It's a category mistake. Uh, what are other category mistakes? Uh, what does blue taste like? You say blue is not a taste. That's right. I'm asking you a taste question about a non-taste thing. See, that's a category mistake. You may know things that are blue that taste like something, but it's not because they're blue they taste like that, right? Blue doesn't give it a taste. Or uh, how many molecules are in justice, like I mentioned earlier? How much carbon is in the justice molecule? You go, wait a minute. Justice isn't a material thing. But I'm asking a material question about an immaterial thing. That's a category mistake. Or you probably heard this. Where was the man when he jumped off the bridge? <laughs> Where was the man? <laughs> uh, no, on the bridge. That was before he jumped. You say he was in the air. That's after he jumped. Where was the man when he jumped off the bridge? It's a category mistake. You're asking a pinpoint question about a process, right? You know where the man was? He was beside himself. <laughs> category mistakes are, you got to be able to recognize these. All right? So, these Miracles are possible if the greatest miracle has already occurred. Now, we haven't gotten to the New Testament yet. We will. But let's say for the sake of argument, the New Testament documents are reliable. Do you notice that Jesus relates two of the most controversial miracles of the Old Testament to his own life, Jonah and Noah? Do you think Jesus thought Jonah and Noah were historical or hysterical? He thought they were histor his historical. Look, if Jesus has really risen from the dead, then I just believe whatever he says. That's my policy. If a guy rises from the dead, I'm going to believe what he says. And if he said Jonah and Noah actually occurred, I'm going with that. And obviously, if God can create the universe out of nothing, he can do Noah and Jonah. Not a problem. If God exists, miracles are possible. Now, C.S. Lewis put it well. He said, but if we admit God, must we admit miracles? Indeed, you have no security against it. That is the bargain. If God exists, miracles are possible. Right? Now, you might say, wait a minute, Frank, not so fast. There's an Englishman. I think he was an Englishman, David Hume. You ever hear of this guy, David Hume? How many have heard of David Hume? A few of us in here. 
David Hume died in 1776, and he had an argument against miracles that is still used today in the modern university to try and get you to believe miracles don't occur, that you shouldn't believe in miracles. I'm going to go through his argument here. It's still being used today. Let's see if it's a good argument. Hume said that natural law is by definition a description of a regular occurrence. You start dropping things. No matter what you drop, you notice that everything seems to go to the ground. You realize there must be some sort of law known as gravity. It's a regular occurrence that when you drop things, things go to the ground and you say that's a natural law. That makes sense, right? Uh, the next point is a, mir a miracle is by definition a rare occurrence. In order for miracles to stand out from natural f laws, they have to be rare. If miracles were occurring all the time, they wouldn't, by definition, be miracles, right? They wouldn't get our attention. They have to be rare events rather than regular events. That seems right. The third uh, point is the evidence for the regular is always greater than that for the rare. We see that when we watch a sporting event, right? We get to see a play from several different angles, at slow speed, at fast speed, as many times as we want, where the ref gets to see the play once, full speed, from one angle, one time. We have better evidence from the regular, we see it over and over again at different speeds, than the ref has seen the play once from a rare event, or, or a rare a uh, one-time event. He sees it from one angle, one speed, so has to make the call. The fourth point is a wise man always bases his belief on the greater evidence. And therefore, Hume's conclusion is this. Therefore, a wise man should never believe in miracles. Now, there's got to be a problem with one or more of these four premises for us to say the conclusion does not follow. But if all of these four premises are true, then the conclusion follows and you, being a wise person, should not believe in miracles. Can anyone see a flaw in any of these premises? This is the interactive portion of the program, Ann, yes? What's that? We won't be a miracle ourselves? Well, we are created. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you could say, well, we're here, so there must be at least one miracle. Yeah. But what, which one of these premises is false, if any? I hear four. No, that seems axiomatic. You're always going to base your belief on the greater evidence, right? Five is the conclusion. You've got to deal with one through four. You'll say one. Someone finally said three. Okay, why three? What's the problem with three? You're right, there is a problem with three. What's the problem with three? Always. 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 Yes, here you go. The answer is the evidence for the regular events is not always greater than that for the rare. Sometimes you have evidence for a rare event, and it's really good evidence, and you should believe it. In fact, let's give some examples. If Hume were here today, He'd be an atheist. He was the only true atheist of the so-called enlightenment. And he would believe in some things that we believe today. Because if he was an atheist, he'd believe in these things. Now, every one of these things I'm about to show you are rare events. Yet Hume would believe in them. And that's how you refute someone's argument. You say, oh, that's your premise? Well, if your premise follows, then you ought not believe these things. But you do believe these things. So let's see what we're talking about here. Notice the Big Bang is not based on regular events. Yet if Hume were here, he would believe it. The Big Bang is a rare event. It happened only once. Yet we have good evidence to believe it. We can't go in the laboratory and recreate the Big Bang and watch it over and over again. Right? It's the Big Bang. It's not the Big Bang, 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 Bang theory, right? You, just, you can't see it over and over again. You can't go and recreate the universe. Actually, you know, over in Switzerland right now, in Geneva, uh, they've got the CERN laboratory there, the, the lasers or whatever they're doing around, uh, around Geneva there. They're accelerating things and they're looking for the Higgs boson and all this. And they've said that it, there's a small possibility that if they do that enough, they might create a black hole and we'll all get sucked into it. Let me just go on record right now that if they actually do that, I'm against it. <laughs> it's going on record, going out on a limb here. 
But no, it's not a regular event and they would believe it. Also, secondly, the origin of life does not occur regularly. We all believe that life began somewhere, somehow, yet it doesn't occur regularly. If you go, if you're a biology student and you sterilize your beaker one night and then uh, you uh, cap it off and the next day you come in and there's life in your beaker and you go to your biology teacher, hey, there's life in my beaker. It, it came spontaneously last night in my beaker. What is your biology teacher going to say? Uh, you didn't sterilize the beaker right. Okay, because no, life doesn't just come from non-life without some sort of cause. Yet we all agree it did at some point. It's a rare event, yet we believe it. We're all here. Uh, Macroevolution cannot be repeated. If it happened at all, it happened only once. We can't repeat it in the laboratory, you know. In fact, Richard Linsky, I think he's at Penn State or Michigan State. I can't remember. He is a biologist who for years, now over 30 years, has been experimenting on E. coli bacteria. He's trying to get E. coli bacteria to evolve into something else. After 30 years, what does he still have? E. coli bacteria. Now, this 30 years would be equivalent to over a million years of human evolution. And he still has E. coli bacteria. He hasn't gotten any real change, significant change in his experiments. He's been able to get them to to process cistrate differently or something, but there's still E. coli bacteria. So if macroevolution happened, it's not a repeatable event. You've just got to look at clues and make an inference from the clues you have. You can't repeat it. Also, C.S. Lewis made the point, the entire history of the earth cannot be repeated. I mean, if Hume were right, he shouldn't even believe his own birth because it happened only once, <laughs> right? In fact, last night when we did part one of this, if you were here, that's a rare event. It happened only once, yet you should believe it. Why? Even though you can't repeat it, you should believe it because you were here. It happened. Even though you can't repeat it and go back into time and witness it over again, you should believe it. So Hume has not disproven miracles, despite the fact that people still teach this in the university. In fact, notice that this particular argument does not in any way touch the possibility of miracles. What it tries to do is refute the believability of miracles. It's saying you ought not believe it. Well, there's something wrong with the theory that says you ought not believe something you know actually occurred, or you have, you, you have good evidence to believe. And that's what Hume is saying here. He's trying to get rid of the believability of miracles, not the actuality of miracles. Let me say one other thing about Hume's point about miracles. And that is a lot of people won't believe in a miracle because they've never seen one. If that's you, that's not a good reason to not believe in miracles. Why? Because you believe in a lot of things you've never seen. Right? You believe in your mind. Have you ever seen it? <laughs> You're using it right now, at least I hope. You believe in the laws of logic. Ever seen those? You believe in the laws of mathematics. Ever seen those? You believe in gravity. Have you ever seen gravity? Nope. Oh, yeah, sure, Frank, there it is. Nope. You're not seeing gravity. What are you seeing? You're seeing the effects of gravity. We don't even know what gravity is. Did you know that? We don't even know what energy is. Some of you work in the energy industry. What do you do? I don't know. <laughs> I don't even know what it is. <laughs> Somehow it gets us places, though, keeps the lights on. There's a lot of things we don't even know, that we don't, we don't even see, and we believe in them. You believe in King George III. Have you ever seen him? No, you believe in a lot of things you haven't seen. And by the way, you shouldn't expect to see a lot of miracles. Why? Hume already told us why. Miracles, by definition, have to be rare. If they were regular, they would, we'd consider them some part of natural law, right? We'd go, hey, this stuff happens all the time. What's the big deal? In fact, resurrections have to be rare. If resurrections occurred frequently, what would the resurrection of Christ mean to us? 
You know, if people were popping up from the dead every couple of weeks, what would the resurrection of Christ mean? You know, you go to somebody, you go, Jesus rose from the dead for your sins. And the guy goes, so what? Uncle Earl just rose from the dead two weeks ago. Now I got to give the inheritance back. Right? No, they have to be rare events if they're going to get our attention. One other thing about miracles that we need to talk about, and that is... A miracle is God overpowering a natural law. We overpower natural laws. I'm overpowering a natural law right now. What is it? Gravity, right? If I can overpower a natural law, can the, the being who created the natural law overpower it? Of course. The question is, when does he do it? He doesn't do it randomly. He does it for specific purposes. In Bible times, it was done to secure a new revelation. To let you know that this person speaks for God and you ought to listen to him. Today he may do it for other reasons. To give somebody faith to believe or to heal somebody that needs to be healed. But he doesn't do it for random reasons. He doesn't do it for entertainment reasons. In fact, I was talking to... Uh, Pastor Die over lunch, and he made the point that some, sometimes miracles may not be done for reasons of mercy. You say, how can that be? He had mentioned that if you look in the Bible, um, Jesus says about Chorazin and Bethsaida, he said if the miracles were done uh, in Tyre, that were done here, they would have believed, but you didn't. Now you're under greater judgment. Think about that. That you might be under greater judgment if a miracle occurs and you don't respond to it. God may be merciful for not bringing a miracle into your life. Because if he did bring a miracle into your life, you still wouldn't trust him. And then you're even more culpable. Imagine that. Now, you might say, well, if miracles are possible and the greatest miracle, the creation of the universe has already occurred, why don't more scientists believe in miracles? This is Richard Lewontin. He's an atheist, Darwinist, Marxist. He's got a lot of is after his name. He teaches at Harvard University. About 20 years ago, he had a very, a very big moment of clarity when he admitted why he and others in the scientific community don't believe in miracles. Here's what he said. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, that we are forced by our a priori, meaning our prior adherence to material causes, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. If we allow a divine foot in the door, what happens? Well, the scientists are no longer seen as the new priests who dispense truth to the general public. Secondly, if God gets his foot in the door, then we're not seen not only by the public as these paragons of virtue who are dispensing truth, but we're not going to be seen by our colleagues as reasonable because it's really considered unreasonable to believe in miracles in the, in the academy. Also, we're not going to get that grant money that we're due to get to do our experiments if we suggest that intelligence is involved in nature. Whoa. We're not going to get that grant money. And then there's that reason we've been talking about, morality and accountability. Morality and accountability. Aldous Huxley famously said, we choose not to believe in a creator because a creator interferes with our sexual mores. Going back to the elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is money, sex, and power. Quite frequently it has to do with sex. We don't want there to be an authority above us because we want to do our own thing. Now, I'm not saying this is true of everybody. I'm simply saying that when you add up all these different motives for denying miracles, you can see why the academy denies them. They don't want miracles to even be possible. They don't want God's foot in the door. Going back to what Pascal said, people almost invariably base their beliefs not on the basis of proof, but on the basis of what they find attractive. I want to be autonomous. I want to do my own thing. I don't want there to be an authority beyond me, so I'm going to deny that authority exists. As we'll see tomorrow night, 
They're using the very natural laws that God has set up in order to do their science while denying he exists. They have to steal from God to say he doesn't exist. 